The discoveries which have occurred over the past several hundred years on the human circulatory system is amazing. I hope in this presentation you find that to, to be true also. Welcome to this presentation on the basic anatomy of the circulatory system and a look in the history of many of the famous doctors and surgeons who have contributed to our understanding of the circulatory system all the way up from how the circulatory system works to transplanting the human heart. I hope you enjoy the presentation and for those of you who are wondering do you really need to know these names? Sadly the answer is yes. You attend a medical school named after a famous osteopathic physician, A.T. Still. Every osteopathic physician knows who he is. It's just important to understand and remember who invented the microscope. Who was responsible for the discovery of penicillin? Who invented the vaccine for polio? And who transplanted the first human heart? These are all amazing discoveries which have paved the way for you to become the good doctor that you plan on being. We owe all of these people a debt in gratitude. Let's take a look and I hope that you do enjoy this presentation. There is some required reading for this presentation and if you read it before you watch the presentation it'll make understanding a lot of the terms and the anatomy easier. First I'd like you to use your introduction to sectional anatomy and read pages 231 to 243. Also, by the time that you've finished your second year and before you sit for your first board exams, you'll need to read Langman's Medical Embryology from front to cover. But for this presentation, you need to read pages 162 to 200. This is an introduction to the embryology of the circulatory system. There's a lot of terminology which will be new, but it will make a lot more sense as you watch the videos that I've incorporated here. And then, for fun, Watch Anatomy for Beginners, a live autopsy. I've put a link here which will take you directly to the video in its entirety. It takes about 45 minutes to watch this, but if you've never seen a human body in an autopsy or if you've never seen a cadaver, this is a good place to start. You don't have to purchase this DVD because I've posted it on Blackboard for you and you can also find it on YouTube. So let's go ahead and get started. And just for fun, the guy on the right there, no, not the plastinated cadaver, but the actual human is Dr. Gunther von Hagens. And he actually is the star of the video, Anatomy for Beginners, A Live Autopsy. You'll need to know who he is too. So really, what is the point of this presentation? Well, let's look at some of the learning objectives. It's important for you to know the history of cardiac surgery and surgery of the circulatory system, as well as those significant names and their respective contributions which are associated with our understanding of the circulatory system. Also, if you look under the paperclip icon, you'll see a couple of documents that I've given you that list out the terms you'll need to be familiar with from watching the video, Anatomy for Beginners, A Live Autopsy. The anatomical, physiological, and pathological terms introduced in the video have been written out for you. Also, you'll need to understand the embryology of the heart, hence the reason that I ask you to read Langman's textbook before you go through this presentation. You'll need to know what a patent foramen ovale is, a ventricular septal defect, and tetralogy of flow. You also need to understand the difference between heart surgery and open heart surgery and who was the important name that did the first open heart operation. Also it would be nice for you to be able to draw the main vessels of the circulatory system and the arterial branches and the venous tributaries as introduced in the video Anatomy for Beginners. If you can do all of this and you know the names as well as the anatomy that we introduced you'll be set to understand and go forward with the circulatory system as we learn it in more detail throughout the year. Believe it or not, there actually was a time when we had no idea how the circulatory system works. Today, we take it for granted that the heart is the center of the circulatory system and through it, blood flows through the arteries returning to the heart via the veins. 
But there was a time when no one actually had this figured out. In fact, William Harvey is given credit for discovering the circulatory pathways of the human heart, and at the time that he was given his doctorate in medicine, he himself didn't know how circulation was even understood. It's said that he dissected the bodies of his own father, his sister, and a cousin's husband in order to learn more anatomy and how the circulatory system works. Please click on the reference which I've given you here as an active link, which will tell you more. It was a couple of crazy Russian scientists that helped us to understand better the circulatory of the human body by doing some really macabre experiments. Here we see an example of some of those experiments. Demikov, who was one of those Russian surgeons, is most famous for the experiment in which he created dogs with two heads. There's a couple of links that I've put here on this slide to YouTube which shows these two-headed dogs. And it's a little macabre, and I warn you, it's a bit graphic, but it's like watching a car wreck. You sort of have to slow down to look at the damage. Nevertheless, this was done at a time before heart transplants, before we even were able to put catheters into our own hearts. We didn't really know anything about the circulatory system. And it's because of some of these crazy experiments that eventually these Russian pioneers were able to give us coronary artery surgery and eventually heart transplant surgery. So before we move on to the circulatory system, let Dr. Robert Acklin show you some of the anatomy of the central most portion of the human circulatory system, the heart. Pause this presentation and then click on the active link for anatomy of the heart. And then if you'd like to see how Dr. Acklin created these videos, click on the bottom link, how the project began. And it explains how Dr. Acklin, who is a retired plastic surgeon, created a series of very impressive DVDs and VHS tapes, which taught hundreds of medical students through cadaveric dissection, the art and the science of anatomy. Now that Dr. Acklin has given you a ride on the gross anatomy of the heart, you'll need to not only go back and review that chapter from Langman's Medical Embryology, but also click on the active link above where Dr. Acklin leads you through an animated series of how the heart forms. It's a really old video, but everybody uses it. It's very well done and it will help put in perspective that reading that you hopefully did from Langman's Medical Embryology on how the heart forms. So here's some really interesting history. After you've taken a moment and looked at the anatomy of the heart and now studied some of the embryology of the heart, you realize that advances in vascular surgery couldn't occur until we figured out how to sew the blood vessels back together. What did we do in the 1700s and mid 1800s when somebody needed an amputation or had transected an artery. The truth is most of those patients probably died of infection or perhaps had an amputation. It wasn't until Alex Carell came along and was able to actually and successfully sew some blood vessels back together. Later on in 1912 he earned the Nobel Prize for his work but he was also interested in transplantation and in 1935, along with Charles Lindbergh, the same Lindbergh that was the first man to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean in the spirit of St. Louis, he devised a mechanism whereby he was able to keep organs alive outside of the body in what was called a sterile respiratory system. So a little bit of surgical history which involves a very famous pilot and an equally famous vascular surgeon. We take so much for granted today, but all of these discoveries had to start somewhere and perhaps one of the most simple yet most important discoveries occurred when Dr. Werner Forsman catheterized himself. In 1929, as a urology resident, he wondered whether he could slip a small plastic tube, we call it a catheter, into his venous system and run it down into the superior vena cava and eventually into the heart. He did it and he ran 
to the radiology department and documented it by taking a chest x-ray. He was fired from his job for doing this, but turns out many years later, he shared the Nobel Prize for this discovery. In fact, even a book he wrote, Experiments on Myself, Memoirs of a Surgeon in Germany, was published, and subsequently he was given a stamp in Uganda commemorating this event. Dr. Forsman's catheterization of the heart has led not only to angioplasty, but angiography of the entire circulatory system. It's led to the ability to insert catheters directly into the heart to measure cardiac output. In other words, the amount of blood that the heart pumps, stroke volume, the amount that the heart pumps with each beat, as well as a plethora of other discoveries from this simple procedure of inserting a catheter down into his heart. In 1929, when he did this, people thought it would cause the heart to stop beating. Of course, we know better. So, only some hundred years later, look how far we've come. There was a time when we believed that catheterizing the circulatory system and the heart itself would stop the heartbeat. Dr. Forsman proved that to be wrong. There was also a time where we believed that you could not operate on the heart. You couldn't open the, the mediastinum and the pericardial sac, and you sure couldn't open the heart. Well, Dr. Alfred Blaylock, a surgeon at Johns Hopkins Hospital, along with his technician Vivian Thomas, offered a palliative treatment for tetralogy of Fallot. It wasn't heart surgery, but it was vascular surgery. And in doing so, they began the long road towards the discovery that would eventually lead us to transplant the human heart. This modified blaylock talzig shunt is still used today for children born with tetralogy of Fallot. What exactly is Tetralogy of Fallot? Well, click on the active link here and it'll take you outside to a video on YouTube explaining very well what Tetralogy of Fallot is. Keep in mind that I just don't pick these video clips randomly. I watch them to make sure that they give you the correct information and that they do it in a really good way that I can't do in one of these presentations. In fact, if a picture is worth a thousand words, a video is worth a million words. Tetralogy of Fallot is a result of four anomalies in the heart, which leaves the baby with a ventricular septal defect, pulmonary artery stenosis, stenosis means narrowing, the aorta which overrides this ventricular septal defect, and the right ventricle gets large. It hypertrophies because it's trying to overcome the ventricular septal defect and the pulmonary artery stenotic area. You'll need to memorize these four anomalies as part of the Tetralogy of Fallot, but I'll make it interesting. Well, exactly how am I going to make learning about Tetralogy of Fallot fun? You're going to watch a movie, that's how. Stop this presentation and click on the link below to the movie Something the Lord Made and watch the movie. It's a terrific movie about a time where the operative procedures which we perform today on the heart didn't exist. Dr. Blaylock and Vivian Thomas came up with a very novel way of treating Tetralogy of Fallot. Combined with Helen Tausig's pediatric cardiology practice, she was able to refer these children who had Tetralogy of Fallot to Dr. Blaylock. And subsequently, this piece of medical history was made into a movie. Click on the link, watch the movie, and I think you'll enjoy it. Now that you've watched the movie, let's take a minute to look at the blaylock talzig shunt. Children who are born with Tetralogy of Fallot simply are not getting enough oxygenated blood out to the periphery. In this caricature of the shunt, on the left you can see the classical shunt where the patient's right subclavian artery was actually divided and then sewn to the pulmonary artery. Now the pulmonary artery normally goes to the lungs where it's oxygenated but here in the child we know that because of the ventricular septal defect that a lot of the oxygenated blood doesn't really make it out through the aorta. 
In fact, from the pulmonary artery stenosis, a lot of the blood leaving the right ventricle doesn't get to the pulmonary artery either. So how do we increase blood flow to the pulmonary artery, oxygenate it, and at the same time allow oxygenated blood to go to the rest of the body? That's the purpose of the shunt. In the classical shunt, the left, excuse me, the right subclavian artery is anastomosed to the pulmonary artery. In the modified version, a piece of Dacron or graft is sewn to the subclavian artery down towards the pulmonary artery. See if you can stare at this long enough to figure out the physiology and why this helps the child. After you stare at it for a few seconds, you'll understand that the red and blue in these pictures isn't quite accurate. Remember, in a child with tetralogy of Fallot, most of the blood entering the aorta is deoxygenated blood because blood from the right ventricle is going through the ventricular septal defect. It's not going into the pulmonary artery because the stenosis of the pulmonary artery keeps blood out of the pulmonary artery and subsequently keeps it from going to the lungs. So what we do is we take this load of deoxygenated blood, which is coming up and out the aorta, and reroute it back to the pulmonary artery where now it goes to the lungs and it becomes oxygenated. I hope this makes sense and if you stare at it long enough I hope it'll make even more sense. So before we could even begin to think about performing surgery on the heart somehow we have to stop the heart and then put it on a heart-lung machine. But back when Blaylock was working on children the heart-lung machine didn't exist so operating on the heart was not possible. Credit for the heart-lung machine is given to Dr. John Gibbon who used it for the first open heart operation to repair an atrial septal defect. That repair performed by Dr. Lily High, we'll see here in a minute, became groundbreaking. Here's what the original heart-lung machine looks like. And then on the right is a modern heart-lung machine, a cardiac bypass machine. You can see that even in Gibbon's day, it was pretty complicated, and it's equally as complicated today. In fact, it requires somebody with a master's degree in perfusion and a very good understanding of physiology of the human body to regulate the pump while the patient is having cardiac surgery. Let's take a look. So here's a picture of how the cardiac bypass machine works. A cannula is inserted into the right atrium and that's labeled blue blood. Blood coming into the heart from the inferior and superior vena cava is deoxygenated and it leaves the body through that large cannula on the far right side of the screen. It becomes oxygenated and then is delivered back to the aorta where the circulation of the pump continues to push it through the body. Now in case you haven't clued in Cardiac bypass is a continuous flow of blood. It's not pulsatile like the heart. And sometimes this causes neurological issues with patients when they wake up from cardiac surgery. Sort of a pump syndrome, as it's called, or pump brain. It seems that the body responds very normally to pulsatile flow. And when we make it continuous flow, like a cardiac bypass machine, it seems to change the way that we think and it does something weird to our brain cells but luckily it's usually only temporary. To get an idea of them watching cardiac surgery to how we put somebody on a pump stop this presentation and click on the link above. Well the next question that you have obviously is how do we hook somebody up on cardiac bypass if the heart is still pumping? Well we don't. We usually stop the heart. It's called cardioplegia. The manner in which the heart is cooled, infused with chemicals, and then also stopped. Most of the time, this is a potassium solution, and it's cooled with ice. That's right, we pour ice into the chest while the patient is in the operating room, and then somebody, usually a resident, holds the heart in this ice bath, for lack of a better word, while the, cor the coronary arteries are then sutured and bypassed. But... What is a perfusionist and what does it take to become a perfusionist? Um, there's a comical video that I've put in here and one not so comical that tells you exactly what it takes to run one of these cardiac bypass machines. These people are not technicians. They're highly trained 
individuals with a good understanding of physiology. Take a look and I hope you learned something about cardioplegia and cardiac bypass. So we've come from catheterizing the heart to being able to stop the heart and then put it on bypass. Now we should be able to open the heart. Dr. Lily High is given credit for this for performing the first open heart operation using cold cardioplegia to stop the heart. But he didn't use the heart lung machine. He stopped the heart using ice, quickly opened the heart, sewed the defect closed, reclosed the heart, and then restarted it by using a defibrillator. Later in life, he was convicted for income tax evasion, and you can read all about his life in a book called King of Hearts. And I would suggest, just for fun, that you click on the photograph of the article here that I put. It's actually an active link, and it takes you to a site that talks about Dr. Lily High's life. He later founded Medtronic, which is still in use today, and most of your patients who come in will have Medtronic pacemakers and defibrillators. It all goes back to Dr. Lily High from the University of Minnesota. At the University of Mississippi, Dr. James Hardy got the crazy idea after he did the first successful human lung transplant in 1963 that he could take the heart from a chimpanzee and sew it into a human being. That patient lived for 90 minutes and never got out of the operating room. Today, that doesn't seem like any surprise because we understand rejection a lot better. And immunology of the body is much better understood. But in 1963 and 64, these were done to keep patients who were destined to die as a last-ditch effort to try to keep them alive. Dr. Hardy went on to not only perform the first human lung transplant in 1963, that patient lived for three weeks and eventually died from kidney failure, to performing this transplant and was the first to do so called a xenograft from another species into a human. We laugh now, but back then this was a big deal, and it also raised a lot of ethical questions. Stop the presentation and click on the link to learn more about Dr. Hart. So 21 years later at Loma Linda University, Dr. Leonard Bailey tried it again. This time he used a baboon's heart instead of a chimpanzee's and put it into a newborn baby, nicknamed Baby Faye, who suffered from hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Basically, the left heart doesn't form. This baby died 21 days later, and we did make use of some of the better immunosuppressive drugs that existed then, like cyclosporine, to help our patients survive rejection episodes. Of course, he was criticized, and 20-something years later, after Dr. Hardy had tried his xenograft, this xenograft failed too. Nobody was really surprised. But this is a landmark case because it opened up many ethical and medical conversations on whether it's possible to do xenografts even in light of current immunosuppressive drugs or whether more science is needed. Stop the presentation and click on the link below to Remembering Baby Faye. I was a junior in college when this occurred and this was large news all over America. So I remember this it seems like yesterday, but it's part of the history of cardiac surgery that made me want to go into medical school. So when exactly was the first human heart transplant done? It was done in December of 1967 by Dr. Christian Barnard in South Africa, who basically stole the technology from Dr. Norman Shumway, Dr. Richard Lauer, Dr. Kantrowitz, and others at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Norman Shumway at the time was a surgeon learning to perform transplants and he knew that it could not be done on humans because of rejection. He had performed the operation hundreds of times on dogs as had Dr. Kantrowitz in New York at Maimonides Hospital. Dr. Lilyhigh, of course had already performed open heart surgery but was using cardioplegia with ice and racing under a stopwatch to try to close the patent for aminal valleys. So Christian Barnard traveled from South Africa to Minnesota and watched Dr. Shumway perform the procedure on dogs 
and learned as much as he could from the University of Minnesota's program. He then went back to South Africa and performed the first adult heart transplant in December of 1967. His patient only lived for 18 days. Stop the presentation and click on the link, Every Second Counts. I want to take a minute just to tell you, don't let medical school rob you of your soul and everything it has to offer. Try to pick up a book outside of all your medical books and read and watch videos. Do anything you can to keep your mind active. And one way which is really enjoyable is to read about the history of medicine, to see just how far we've come. If you are so inclined, you can purchase Every Second Counts for your Kindle or your iPad. I think it's worth it worth the read. So once we were able to transplant the heart, exactly what is the technique? Well, early on, heterotopic heart transplantation was also performed. This is where a second heart was basically piggybacked onto a patient's existing heart. Of course, you can see all types of issues with this, not only rejection, but creating enough size in the chest cavity to do this. Eventually now we remove the heart and we do an orthotopic heart transplant where the patient's atria are left in place and then the large vessels are then sewn or anastomosed to the transplant heart. What this does is on the patient's EKG, and you'll understand this later, the atria signal of the patient's heart leaves a mark on the patient's EKG along with the atria signal from the new heart. You can look at an EKG and immediately tell whether a patient's had a heart transplant or not just from these weird different beats. You'll learn more about that in your cardiac course. So Dr. Christian Barnard, the doctor sitting on the left, was the first to use a adult to adult heart transplant in South Africa where his patient lived for 18 days. The doctor sitting on the right is Dr. Adrian Kantrowitz, who was the first to perform a pediatric heart transplant in the United States. He actually performed the first heart transplant in the United States even though it wasn't successful. And then in the center of this picture standing is Dr. Michael DeBakey. This picture is really incredible because we see three cardiac surgeon pioneers who've all led us to the current state of heart surgery where it is today. Well, you saw his picture in the previous slide, but Dr. Adrian Kantrowitz from Maimonides Hospital in New York was actually the first in the United States to transplant a human heart. He transplanted the heart from an anencephalic infant, in other words, a baby that's born without a brain. Of course, and as expected, the baby that he transplanted the heart into only lived a few hours. This was only three days after Christian Barnard had performed his transplant in South Africa and there was a lot of conversation over Christian Barnard's unethical use of the technology that he didn't invent of the surgical procedure that he didn't perfect this was a large discussion and it hit all of the magazines all of the important magazines like Time and Newsweek back in the 1960s and 70s when this went on we'll learn more about that in just a second while doctors were studying how to transplant the heart and make it work, even though immunology hadn't caught up to the surgical techniques, other doctors like Dr. David Sabiston from Duke University was working on ways to perform heart surgery on the coronary arteries. Dr. Sabiston was actually the first surgeon in America to try a coronary artery bypass grafting. His didn't work. If you remember, this operation came from those surgeons that created the two-headed dog. Later on, Dr. Michael DeBakey in Texas performed the first successful coronary artery bypass graft operation in the United States. Dr. DeBakey went on to do a lot of great things, and we'll talk about him in just a second. Dr. DeBakey performed the first cabbage, a coronary artery bypass grafting. That's how we pronounce it. He also was the first to clean out the plaque from a carotid artery in the neck. It's called a carotid end arterectomy, and if you want to see how this is done, pause the presentation and click on the video link to watch how this operation is performed today to help decrease the incidence of stroke. 
He was also the inventor of the first Dacron graft for repairs of aneurysms of the largest vessel in the body, the abdominal aorta. And interestingly, it was his own technology, i.e. the Dacron graft and his surgical procedures for treating aneurysms of the aorta that saved his life when he was 92 years old. Dr. DeBakey had a large thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm and initially refused surgery. But later, they did perform the operation. He was in the hospital for three months and he went on to live another seven years. The very graft that he invented and sewed at home on his wife's sewing machine, i.e. the Dacron graft, later on saved his own life. However, along with Dr. Denton Cooley and the inventor of an artificial heart, Dr. Akutsu, it led to a very public feud between Dr. Cooley and Dr. DeBakey because Dr. DeBakey had accused Dr. Cooley of stealing the technology and putting the first artificial heart into a patient. We'll talk about this later and again it made all of the big newspapers. Even Life magazine at the time showed these two surgeons on the cover. Initially Dr. Cooley who <clears throat> worked at the Texas Heart Institute, initially worked at Baylor University along with Dr. DeBakey. But Dr. Cooley left and took Dr. Akutsu's heart with him where they used it at the Texas Heart Institute to insert it into a, a patient and to save the patient's life. These gentlemen didn't speak for years and this feud was well known among all surgeons across America, enough to make Life magazine. Later on, when Dr. Cooley was 87 years old and Dr. DeBakey was in his late 90s, did they finally shake hands in front of a group of surgeons and make amends. But Dr. Cooley is known for a lot more than just creating a lot of drama with Dr. Michael DeBakey at Baylor Hospital. Dr. Cooley trained at Johns Hopkins under Dr. Blaylock and later went to Baylor eventually left and formed the Texas Heart Institute and he took with him Dr. Akutsu. Rumor is is that Dr. DeBakey was very difficult to work with and Dr. Akutsu didn't want to work with DeBakey. He left and in the middle of the night they took the heart over to the Texas Heart Institute where a patient was waiting to have the heart put in. Dr. Cooley is given credit for performing the first artificial heart implantation with this Akutsu heart and later with another heart developed by Dr. Leota called of course the Leota heart. He was also the first a year after Dr. Christian Barnard to be the first surgeon to successfully perform a human adult heart transplant in 1968. Stop this presentation and click on the video link to read about the Texas Heart Institute and all of the drama that this is about. It made all of the newspapers, Life magazine and at the time other magazines such as Newsweek and Time. Dr. Cooley trained under Dr. Alfred Blaylock and if you watch the movie Something the Lord Made you'll rapidly pick up that Dr. Cooley is portrayed in that movie. He's also given credit for having developed a cardiac defibrillator along with Dr. Lily High and makes an interesting quote. You can read this quote if you click on the link below to an interview with Dr. Cooley. And he says, quote, I've always felt the reason I performed so well as a student was because I lacked confidence. Perhaps the quote should be the reason that he performed so well and overachieved as a student was because he lacked confidence. It's a great interview and I hope you take a minute to at least click on it and watch a couple of those clips. Well, we're not done yet because most of the work on this heart transplant was performed by very few select surgeons at the University of Minnesota. If you remember, the University of Minnesota was where Dr. Lily High came from, where Dr. Norman Shumway trained, Dr. Richard Lauer, and a lot of other celebrated heart surgeons. The first successful heart transplant was performed thanks to Dr. Shumway's research at Stanford University. While Dr. Shumway may not have been the first to do the heart transplant, he definitely is the one who perfected the technique and trained the other surgeons to do it. 
It was from Dr. Shumway, whose picture is here on the left, that Dr. Christian Barnard basically stole the technology. On the right is Dr. Richard Lauer, who was at the Medical College of Virginia. What's interesting about this slide and why I put both of them together is that both Dr. Shumway and Lauer were sued, not for murder, but for, I believe, manslaughter. It was because of this suit that we now have a legal definition of brain death. At the time, it was believed to take a beating, functioning heart to transplant it. So if a patient was going to lose the pulse or the doctors were afraid that a chemical or a acid base balance would destroy the body's ability to maintain the pulse, the doctors would actually intervene and remove the heart to use for transplant before metabolic damage could occur. Neither of them were convicted, thank God, but it led to a legal storm and legal definitions which we use today to define death. Death being brain death, not cardiac death. So we started out with Dr. Forsman who catheterized himself and that led to coronary angiograms. Eventually we learned from Demikov and DeBakey and Sabiston how to perform coronary artery bypass grafting as well as cleaning out plaque from the carotid arteries. All the way up to Dr. Shumway and Lauer's work on heart transplantation. Eventually to a transplant by Dr. Christian Barnard. An attempt at a transplant in a baby by Dr. Kantrowitz and the successful transplant by Dr. Cooley, and then the use of an artificial heart for when organs are not available. Well, Dr. William Kolf, who is an MD-PhD at the University of Utah, known as the father of artificial organs, actually is given credit for inventing a dialysis machine. He also introduced artificial ventricles and combined with Dr. Robert Jarvik, invented the Jarvik 7 total artificial heart. Dr. Jarvik, however, was always a research physician and never practiced medicine. Today, he creates the heart under the, quote, Jarvik heart name. But interestingly, after the heart was first put in a human being, it underwent several clinical trials, was removed from the market by the FDA, and then at the University of Arizona, it was picked up and used again, where a couple of design changes was made and it was reintroduced as the Syncardia heart. We'll talk about all of this later. It's just more of the fascinating history behind the surgery and the anatomy of the circulatory system. We know that Dr. Cooley was the first one to implant an artificial heart. He used the Akutsu heart and later the Leota heart. However, in 1984, the University of Utah got a lot of press because of Dr. Barney Clark, who was a dentist, who under the care of Dr. Jarvik and Dr. DeVries, received the Jarvik 7 total artificial heart. The patient eventually died of a stroke and the heart was blamed as the cause, but that turned out to not be true. The heart was not thrombogenic as people thought. In other words, it didn't cause the clots. However, for a period of time, the heart was pulled from the market, and then years later, after a series of events here in the Phoenix and Tucson areas occurred, did artificial hearts again get reintroduced. Dr. Robert Jarvik now markets his heart under the Jarvik name, and at the University of Arizona, Dr. Jack Copeland took the Jarvik heart, made some changes, now markets it under the Syncardia name. Dr. Copeland now is at University of California, San Diego. Interestingly, Pfizer, a drug company, used Dr. Robert Jarvik in its Lipitor ads. Lipitor is a drug used for lowering cholesterol. It came under fire because Dr. Jarvik has actually never practiced medicine. He's never had a license to practice medicine, and apparently a body double was also used in the commercial. This caused Pfizer to remove the ads and to remove him as their spokesman. Let's take a look at some of this convoluted history of the use of the artificial heart. In the early 1980s, the University of Utah became the center for the controversy over the use of the artificial heart. The Jarvik 7 artificial heart was placed into a retired dentist, Dr. Barney Clark, in December of 1982. 
This became the world's first Jarvik 7 total artificial heart implantation. Dr. DeVries trained under Dr. Sabastin at Duke University. The Life magazine cover above shows Bill Schrader, who was the second individual at the University of Utah to receive the artificial heart. All of these names in the early 1980s were household names. Barney Clark, Bill Schrader, William DeVries, Robert Jarvik, Cooley, DeBakey, all of these names were in the newspapers nearly every day. It was a race for the top. Shortly afterwards, at the University of Arizona, Dr. Jack Copeland had a young 32-year-old patient who was dying from heart failure. Dr. Copeland did not have, at that time, a human donor and decided to use an artificial heart to bridge the patient. What ended up happening was Dr. Copeland used a heart which was actually designed at St. Luke's Hospital here in Phoenix with the help of another cardiac surgeon in Phoenix called Doc, uh, by the name of Dr. Cecil Vaughn. Dr. Vaughn and Dr. Copeland, against FDA approval, inserted the Phoenix heart into this 32-year-old man as a temporary measure until he could actually get a human heart and get transplanted. Unfortunately, the patient died, died but this was an opening to use artificial hearts instead of a permanent replacement rather as a temporary replacement or a bridge to transplant. Dr. Copeland is given credit for having used the first Jarvik 7 to bridge a patient to a tr successful transplant at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Dr. Copeland trained under Dr. Norman Shumway at Stanford University. If you pause the presentation and click on the link to the New York Times article and then a link to the Phoenix Heart, you can relive some of this drama. In this picture, we see Dr. Copeland sitting on the far right, his patient, Dr. Michael Drummond, who was the first patient to be bridged with the artificial heart, and then sitting next to Dr. Drummond, third from the right, is a very young Dr. Robert Jarvik. Today, cardiac transplants are commonplace, and patients with transplants can live up to 10, 12, 15 years or even longer. But let's take a look at some of the anatomy. In this picture, we can see the heart in the center covered by a thin membranous sac called the pericardial sac. You can see the lungs and, of course, the thymus gland, which sits just right over the upper aspect of the heart. Let's take a look deeper into this anatomy. Here's some anatomy in the center of the chest. The center of the chest is called the mediastinum, and we call these vessels the great vessels. In other words, the vessels coming into and directly off of the heart. We can see the superior vena cava. The inferior vena cava is not well shown. The pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries can be seen. The aorta and the thoracic aorta, as well as the vessels coming off the aorta up into the neck, the carotid arteries, and the subclavian arteries. I don't label these here, and I don't go through it with you point by point because I actually want you to grab your anatomy book, open it, and to learn the names of these structures. It's important that you know the names of the great vessels. The heart, of course, you've seen the anatomy and Dr. Acklin has shown you a video of the anatomy of the heart itself. Now let's learn the great vessels. The superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, the pulmonary arteries, both left and right and pulmonary trunk, and the aorta. Once blood leaves the heart and goes into the aorta, it goes up into the neck. The aorta has three basic branches that come off of it at the apex. The first is the brachiocephalic artery, which gives rise to the right common carotid artery and then the subclavian artery. A second branch off of the arch of the aorta is the left common carotid artery and then the third branch is the left subclavian artery. Of course, you can see the thoracic aorta, and we'll get into all this anatomy later. But for now, the structures which are important for you to learn are the heart proper with its four chambers and the large vessels coming into the heart, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, the pulmonary veins, the pulmonary trunk, the pulmonary arteries, and the arch of the aorta with its three main branches. 
Of course, it's not fair to talk about the arteries without talking about the veins. Let's take a look here. Up in the neck, you can see the right brachiocephalic vein giving rise to the right subclavian vein and the left subclavian vein, as well as the left and right jugular veins. Of course, you can see the vein coming posteriorly from the superior vena cava called the azagous vein. We'll get into all of these details later, but for now, the structures that I want you to know include the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, the right brachiocephalic vein, the left brachiocephalic vein, the right jugular vein, the left jugular vein, the right subclavian vein, the left subclavian vein, and the large azagous vein. So as we continue our study of the circulatory system, eventually the aorta leaves the chest and enters the abdomen through what's called the abdominal aorta. Here you can see the abdominal aorta in red and immediately adjacent to it is the inferior vena cava. The abdominal aorta eventually divides just at about the level of the belly button into the right and left common iliac arteries. These common iliac arteries then give way to an external iliac artery and an internal iliac artery. The names of the veins follow along the names of the arterial structures by the same name. For now, this is all the anatomy that I want you to learn. We'll go into it in a lot more depth later. The structures that I would like you to learn in the abdomen are the abdominal aorta with the left and right common iliacs, the left and right external iliac, the left and right internal iliac, the inferior vena cava, left and right common iliac veins, and the left and right common femoral veins. We'll get to the branches of the aorta later. So at this point in the presentation, we've gone through the pertinent cardiac history as well as the pertinent cardiac anatomy for this stage early in your medical school careers. We're going to get into a lot more depth of the anatomy of the circulatory system. But for now, if you would like to review all of the things up to this point, including the plethora of procedures made possible by Dr. Forsman's first catheterization of his own heart, take a look at the anatomy of the heart and the procedures made possible by its understanding. Put this presentation on pause, click on the link, and it will review the anatomy of the heart and the mediastinum, as well as the anatomy of the aorta. In addition, I've put in several videos which show you coronary angiograms, cardiac catheterizations, including a catheterization during a heart attack, the ultrasound of the heart through the esophagus called a transesophageal cardiac echo, as well as an ultrasound of the heart by using the probe directly over the skin of the chest called a transthoracic cardiac echo. We'll also look at high resolution cardiac CT scanning, the insertion of a catheter directly into the heart that allows us to measure pressures, volumes, and temperature of the heart, and of course, a link showing coronary artery bypass grafting surgery. A lot of information, a lot of videos, I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you have the opportunity to not only watch Dr. Ackland's videos, but the videos of the autopsy performed by Dr. Gunther von Hagens, as well as the movie, Something the Lord Made. It's a long presentation, but it is an introduction to medical school, and at this point, I think the more that you can understand the clinical significance of the anatomy that I'm going to teach you this year, the better that you'll understand why we're teaching, what we do, and the reasons we're doing it the way we are. Thank you, and I'm always open to comments and criticisms. Don't forget to click on the paperclip icon to download the PDF attachments that are attached to this presentation. Oh, and one more thing. To help you recall and to work on all these names and putting it in your memory banks, besides using flashcards, I put together a small quiz at the end of this presentation it's about 35 to 40 questions. A couple of the questions have multiple answers, but most of them are simple multiple choice with single answers. This will help you to reinforce the names of what I think are important to remember on the history of cardiac surgery. And of course, all of these names are fair game for an upcoming examination. Thank you.